what's up everybody? <laughs> yeah, happy new year actually. Well, it's not new year's yet, but as of recording, it's December 30th. Yep, today I'm gonna do a, another review, I guess I would say. I don't really call my videos reviews, more like quick thoughts. But today I'm doing quick thoughts on Babylon for director Damien Chazelle, right here in LA. And you're asking me, why in LA? Why not in your local movie theater? Well, it's a Q&A with Damien Chazelle. Hopefully it's an in-person one because I really do like the in-person Q&As like last year with Steven Spielberg. But my point is, is that, oh, I'm excited today. I haven't seen Babylon yet, heard mixed reviews from critics and everyone else. Especially that cinema score getting a C rating. I'm like, what? I don't even like cinema score. But yeah, let's, let's run to see Babylon. I'll give you my quick thoughts on that very soon. Oh, I miss this place so much. It's been a while since I've been here. So yeah, about the film. Yeah, so I it heard it takes place around the 2020s. I mean, not the 2020s, the 1920s. You know, around during the talkies to, I mean, from sound to talkies, you know, that era of, of cinema that changes everything. Yeah, it's pretty much what this film is going to be about, so. I hope it's really good. I mean, I love previous gaming Giselle movies like La La Land and, and Whiplash and First Man. Those are all great films he has done. And yeah, he's like one of the youngest filmmakers to win an Academy Award for Best Director at the time in 2016, I remember. So yeah, pretty excited what, the, what this film's gonna do. As I said, mixed reviews, well, it happens with many movies nowadays. Well, time to go in. Oh, finally to put up the, the sign, I don't call these ad signs. Well, show's about to start very soon, so very excited for this. What a movie. Is this on? <laughs> Paramount. Hello. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, what did you think of Babylon? Yeah. My name is Scott Nance. I am so thrilled to have you here with us tonight here at the AMC Century City. Please welcome to the stage writer, director, Academy Award winner, Damien Chazelle. changing 
uh, the most effective way. Um, and you know, uh, yeah, that just came from sort of lots of you know combo of old Hollywood stories I sort of knew, and then just reading new stuff, stumbling on new stuff, people who were kind of on the margins, for instance, of the industry. So I already knew a lot about the sort of John Gilberts and. Clara Bowes, you know, the people, for instance, who sort of informed Brad and Margot's characters, these you know, kind of movies, that, that sort of prototype of a movie star at the time who did not, for whatever reason, cope with sound. Um, but a lot of the people who were more, again, on the periphery of the industry and had this sort of more fleeting moment of sort of centrality and that either due to, due to the transition or due to something else peripheral to it, uh, people like uh, Joe Maladepo's character, some of the jazz musicians of that era kind of got sucked into the vortex of Hollywood when sound came in. Um, you know, uh, Anime Wong, people like that, who sort of informed uh, Lady Feijou's character. So, you know, Manny's character was sort of based on a lot of um, kind of, uh, you know, sort of shards and bits and pieces of stories, because none of them were that famous ultimately, but bits and pieces of stories about um, uh, uh, people in who kind of, you know, would rise up the ranks very quickly from a, a, a place of totally outside the industry, you know, not, not just sort of bottom of the rung in terms of the types of jobs they were doing, but you know, uh, even outside of any specter of polite society um, in Los Angeles at that time, you know, for, for instance, the immigrant, the Mexican immigrant community uh, there, a lot of them were coming in during the Mexican, Mexican Revolution, and so you have this sort of burgeoning community in the 20s, a lot of whom wound up getting sort of bit jobs and bit parts in Hollywood in the sort of burgeoning industry of the time. Um, and a few of whom were able to rise the ranks and, and, and even have these kind of moments, again, usually fleeting, but moments of power or moments of a real foot in the door. So it, it was a mix of all those things, of sort of some certain stories I already knew, certain stories that were totally new to me, and then trying to kind of um, you know, hone them down, knowing the bigger story I wanted to tell. You know, when you're watching Babylon, and definitely when you're also watching La La Land, it is clear that singing in the rain struck a massive chord with you. Uh, what is it, or what was it about that film? Okay. When did the, that chord really get struck? Like, when did you watch that movie and go, oh my God, like get that inspiration where it's clearly been a huge part of two of your films? Uh, well, I thought the, I mean, so the movie itself I've loved forever. Um, Actually, I shouldn't say that forever, because I, I used to hate musicals. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you would never know that. I know, I know. I, it was sort of a, you know, I compensated in a way. Uh, I, I wound up falling in love so hard, um, almost to compensate for the fact. So as soon as that love affair began, um, uh, Singing in the Rain, of course, you know, sort of was, was, was front and center. But I think, you know, then just being interested in the making of some of those classic old Hollywood musicals, just by my interest in the genre, reading about the making of Sing in the Rain, I became even more fascinated by that because there was this whole backstory to Sing in the Rain that um, that wasn't as familiar to me. You know, uh, for instance, the fact that none of the songs in Sing in the Rain, uh, except for one exception, were written for the film initially. They were all pre-existing hit songs, most of them from the 20s. Um, and in fact, the way Sing the Rain came about as a movie was that Arthur Freed, who was running sort of, Arthur, you know, sort of the unit of musical, musicals at MGM at the time in the 50s, uh, he had this, you know, he was kind of looking for a new movie idea. He, had, he was a producer. He had this back catalog of songs that he and some colleagues had written back in the 20s that um, felt like, you know, uh, he should use them for a musical. So it's exactly the same thing as if, you know, someone gives you a stash of songs, you know, that you happen to have the rights to. It gives you, like, you know, the you know, like the Queen catalog or the Beatles catalog or something says, yeah, you know, yeah. figure out a story for this. Um, so Arthur Freed, you know, sat with some writers and tried to figure out what's a story that could link all these songs together. And um, because they were all from this period, the period of this movie, it quickly sort of dawned on him, you know what, why don't we just tell a story about what was going on in Hollywood uh, during that time um, and what the first context for a lot of these songs were. Um, and so, you know, that, that little nugget in the middle of the movie when Singing in the Rain, that was the first time that Singing in the Rain was actually put on film. It wasn't Gene Kelly, it was in 1929. Yeah. One of the first musical numbers Hollywood ever attempted. Um, you know, this kind of very weird, um, I mean, you can find it, those of you who haven't seen it, you can find it on YouTube. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I was, it's just as weird and garish as what we present on screen. You know, it's, it's a lineup of all of MGM's biggest stars at the time lined up on bleachers 
in front of the giant backdrop of Noah's Ark with these weird rain slickers on and these kind of grinning faces with too much makeup and rain pouring and they're, and they're sort of dancing and they're dancing, you know, uh, and, and, and singing. Uh, that was the, you know, that was the screen introduction of Singing in the Rain. Um, so, uh, you know, the kind of going backwards from a movie made in the 50s that I loved so much and sort of finding a little bit kind of where the germs of it were. Um, and then you start to kind of figure out, well, who were these people based on? Who was Gene Hagen's character, you know, with the crazy, uh, very famously grating voice? Who was she based on? Who was uh, Gene Kelly's character based on? Where did the whole I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you thing that Gene Kelly does in the movie, where did that come from? Um, all the little stories and jokes in Sing the Rain came from real things. Um, and so, so it felt like maybe kind of trying to cue, on, on the one hand, a little closer to the reality where those things happen, yet on the other hand, this is also a fictional film, so trying to kind of take my own liberties with it. Um, but I would say going in sort of the opposite direction so that they could be kind of cousins to each other in a weird way. Sing the Rain, of course, is a much more optimistic, rosy version of, of that transition. Um, I felt like there was a lot of you know, dirt under the fingernails and a lot of grime that had been swept under the rug that was worth unpacking and bringing out to light. So that was sort of what drove me. You know, when I was watching the film for the first time, and I saw it three times, FYI. Uh, <laughs> so I did not know that Singing in the Rain was performed back then. I thought it was performed for the first time for, for the Gene Kelly movie. But it got me thinking about all the research that you did to capture that time because just a lot of people I spoke to after many of the screenings were like, wow, is Hollywood really like that in the 20s? I thought, I thought cocaine was an 80s thing, not a 20s thing. <laughs> um, but it was, I guess. I mean, uh, you know, that, was, that must have been just such a big uh, revelation for you during all that. But what were some of the bigger wow moments that you discovered while you were doing your dissertation with your research? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'll the, the, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess just to jump off what you're saying, the, the level to which drug use, for instance, was so, um, I would say not just prevalent in Hollywood at the time, but kind of at the DNA of it, it was so, um, you know, I think it counts in some ways for some of that sort of crazed energy that was in the air. It's also a weird time, if you look at kind of the history of drug use in America, it's, it, the 20s are an interesting time because, you know, depending on where you are in the country and when, when in the 20s you are, a lot of these drugs we now think of as hard drugs are much more legal than alcohol, you know, and so, uh, so cocaine was, uh, w was everywhere, but it wasn't really the way, necessarily the way we think of cocaine today or the way you thought of it in the 70s or 80s, it was just a little different, you know, they, they would even kind of flagrantly, um, there was a whole genre, a whole subset of kind of Max Senate adjacent silent comedies in the teens going into the early 20s with people like Fatty Arbuckle and whatnot, that they literally just called cokey comedies. And you can, those you can find, you can find online too. And, and you'll kind of be shocked that they were made back then because they're just, it's all characters running around who are clearly on cocaine. And, and they're called cokey comedies and they're just, you know, and, uh, but then you remember like, ah, you know, it's like actually, it, there was a moment there, a fleeting moment, before it was all illegalized where it actually almost felt normal. You know, heroin went through a similar kind of uh, uh, journey as well. Um, so, so that was one thing that was really interesting. I, I think the other thing was also just how, how much and rapidly Hollywood changed in such a short span of time. I think that, uh, you know, we often think of history as taking a long time. Things all sort of happen slowly. So you think of a, a town like Los Angeles taking its modern shape over a long course of time. But one of the unique things about LA and about Hollywood by extension was how abrupt these, these you know, this shift initially was. So such that really within the span of, you, we tried to gesture to it in the movie, within the span of, you know, certainly 10 years, but I'd say even less, even within that, you know, maybe seven, six years, you can really feel in your gut, I think, just looking at the photographs and whatnot, a mostly rural, sort of dusty cow town morphing into one of the world's great cities. Um, yeah. and, 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 and then with the, you know, the concurrent uh, change happening within that of a sort of ragtag, almost circus feeling kind of group of people making this new thing called movies, uh, this very vulgar art form that's not considered a true art you know, by high society, that's, that's sort of um, somewhere below vaudeville you know, in terms of the echelon of things. Uh, that sort of circus-like atmosphere uh, morphing into this absolute behemoth, into one of America's biggest uh, 
uh, exports into one of the world's biggest businesses and to, you know, and, and the kind of the corporate Hollywood we think of today, you know. It, it, and so just how that transition happens so fast. And of course, whenever you have transitions happening that fast, you know, sometimes they're brought about by wars, sometimes, you know, but, but in this case, it wasn't that. It was just this weird influx, you know, sort of uh, uh, weird cross-section of circumstances. When things happen that fast, there's always going to be collateral damage. There's going to be, there's going to be, you know, the sort of gleaming new emblems of progress and achievements that we can all sort of feel proud about. And then there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, basically corpses, for lack of a better word, sort of strewn in the wake. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, that, I knew there was rich terrain there to mine and, and to sort of, you know, try to be holistic about. In terms of that rich terrain, so there's that, the, the midpoint of the film there is when Manny is seeing a crowd reacting to a jazz singer. And he runs out and gets on the phone, everything's changing. And then the very next scene, I love the, love the way you, you, you turn on this light, turn on that light, like it's really poetic. Like that transition that you're talking about, the way things change so fast, is that you have one moment, you have all these different things that are filming at the same time. It doesn't matter, it's silent. You're not gonna hear what's going on over there. We can film something over here. And then, you know, poor Nelly, she has to say hello college eight times. And each time it's like she misses a mark or there's sound was low or somebody's shoes were not rubber soles. Like, like you just see like, holy shit, like everything is changing. Like, yeah. Now we can't do anything the way we did it before. Yeah, the wheels, so, the wheels fall off the wagon. Yeah. So when it came to filming the Hello College sequence, yeah. uh, how did you stage that? And, and how much of all that changed? Uh, did you made it into the film? And how much didn't make it into the film? Oh, I mean, yeah, most, most of that's in the film, partly because it was, um, in a way, unlike a lot of the rest of the film, it was very intentionally, you know, sort of kind of timed out and planned to within a T of itself. It's yeah. almost, I almost wanted it to have a kind of schematic lifelessness to it, because that's sort of what, so the camera, you know, a camera that's been just unmoored before then, and just, you know, doing figure eights all over the place, is pretty much static in that scene. And then of course it goes handheld a little bit by the end, but mostly the camera doesn't move at all or just moves with the person, you know. Um, the, uh, the cutting patterns become really repetitive, intentionally so, you know, so it was kind of like trying to lean into all the, all the things that would represent the polar opposite of the kind of language and style the movie has sort of um, had in the first half. Um, and, but I guess all, all of it again, it just comes back to trying to capture the spirit, you know, um, of, of, of that time as I interpreted it. You know, there were certain things that, you know, were just so ironic to me, in a way, you know, given that sound was supposed to be this technological advance for film, but how much regression it sort of brought with it, you know, that movies that went from uh, total freedom, you know, uh, I mean, by the end of the silent era, they're doing everything with the camera that they do today. You know, they're doing handheld, they're doing multiple cameras, they're doing, uh, they're doing obviously very mobile, you know, sort of incredible, you think of some of Murnau's crane shots, I mean, just incredible movement. Um, and uh, crazy experimentation, and, you know, uh, Adolf Gauss is doing three, you know, uh, uh, three, you know, three pan, like almost predict, you know, predicting Cinerama decades before the fact, they have 3D, uh, or, you know, a certain version of 3D before the fact, they're tinting films, they have, you know, uh, early technicolor processes. Anyway, they have so much stuff that you would think of as coming much later uh, at that end of the silent era, and then sound comes in and boom, just undercuts all of that. It's suddenly it's just about, okay, we have to just, figure out how to make this image that will allow the sound to marry to it. And so we haven't yet figured out, you know, uh, quite how to rejigger everything. For instance, we haven't quite figured out yet in those first couple years how to edit sound. So the sound you get on set is the sound you're gonna be stuck with. So you better not sneeze or, you know, miss your mark or something. Uh, you know, uh, we can't hear, a, we don't wanna hear a camera rolling during that time. So the camera's gotta be uh, put inside a box. Uh, much to, the, much to the chagrin of the, the DPs having operated. You know, you can't have air flowing through the, you know, we, we gotta be locked on a sound stage. Uh, everyone's gotta be quiet. Again, the greatest irony of all, that sound coming in, that suddenly you start seeing something that you never saw in the silent era. Silence, please, silence. Yeah. 
the idea of a sound stage. Why is it called a sound stage? It's, you know, these things were, uh, you know, they sometimes. <laughs> it's not that they never shot silent films on stages or inside, but the entire approach changed. The red light, the you know, the no no windows. I mean, it was just a much more open air approach before that then just got really hermetic and kind of sealed. Um, eventually, of course, you know, you jump ahead in time and they figured out a lot of these kinks. They figured out the boom mic and they figured out how to make less noisy cameras, less noisy lights, etc. But man, I just, I shudder to think that what that first year, you know, uh, first year or two must have been like for filmmakers who just weeks before, you know, were, were shooting out with, you know, camera on horse cars and out in the, you know, out in the fields with, you know, thousands of extras, I mean, it just must have been, uh, yeah. That was a breeze compared to what, what the, the, the problems. I can understand that, yeah, that sense of an immediate loss that they yeah. must have felt, you know, um, even while being conscious that maybe the art form is moving forward in some fundamental way, man, we've lost something that, um, that will, you know, that you, you had to think at that time will never get back. You know, when, when you're going from, from Whiplash to Wallow Land to First Man, and, and with the way that the, the bar is raised e with each film that you make, I mean, the bar just like went through the roof filming Babylon. At what point did you feel, sort of like feel, maybe, I don't know, daunted, you know, or <laughs> you know, all the time? Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely all the time. I think, uh, I think I speak for everyone involved in the movie. We all, um, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, it, it, it I think part of the problem was that um, because we wanted to be sort of this panoramic portrait of a society, it's easy to say all these things and kind of write, it's easy to write them down on paper to a certain extent, but to actually sort of execute them with, you know, when you have a certain, you have a certain box, you know, you have your budget and, and you know you can't go outside of that um, and, and you don't have as much time as you want, you don't have as many resources as you want, but you know that you have this kind of privileged chance to do this, so you're not going to complain, you're just going to figure out a way to make it happen. Yeah. Um, you know, but it, you know, it comes down to simple things like, for instance, trying to recreate the feeling of shooting a battle scene at the height of the silent era when it would be routine for them to have thousands upon thousands of, you know, warriors in the field. Um, obviously, we couldn't have that, you know, so it's, you, you try to, in some ways, the, the camera style of the film was dictated by that as well. It was trying to always make it feel like there was more stuff extending past the edges of the frame. So you never quite feel that, I mean, when in reality, really, we were just taking every living soul, you know, that we could, and like putting them right there in the frame, and there's nothing on left and right, you know. Uh, every piece of decor we had, you know, but you try to make it seem like it's kind of grabbed at at random, that it's sort of, that there, that there really is this 360, you know, kind of reality that the camera happens to be gliding through. And, um, so, but all of that, it's, it's one big charade, you know, and, and, and figuring out how to stage that kind of a charade, you know, it takes planning, it takes a great group of collaborators who I was lucky to have, incredible DP, production designer, costume designer, whatnot, so, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, but, but yeah, that, that's the real challenge of it, is to make less feel like more. So, so when we see Jack and Nelly uh, sort of meet their end, you know, with Jack, it's very dramatic, but with Nelly, like, this, this scene really is, I find it very haunting. The way Manny goes into the building and Nellie gets out of the car and she literally just disappears into the night and the camera holds onto the night like she literally disappears. Um, what was, and this is why I gotta do the deep dive. What was behind that moment? Like, like, like filming that moment? Like what made you go, okay, well we see what happens to Jack. We don't really see what happens to Nelly, but what was behind, like, this is how I want to shoot her last moment? Uh, that was in the script. I, I, I have a hard time remembering exactly kind of where that sort of, you know, uh, yeah, how, how it sort of found itself. I, I, I know the basic idea of it was just that, you know, when I, when I made that sort of um, reference just earlier to this idea of, uh, you know, a movie about a kind of party energy party atmosphere that then ends you know the plug gets pulled the, yeah. the lights get shown on the party's over everyone you got to go home now uh, some people can adapt to that some people can collect their things and go got it okay and you know yeah. go home and other people just cannot that as soon as you sort of tell them the party's over they 
it, it's like telling them they're dead, that there's just this need inside them to keep it going. So I think early on it felt appropriate for someone like Nellie that literally the last thing we saw of her would just be her, you know, uh, basically keeping the party alive in her head, you know, yeah. so just, just humming, uh, you know, kind of in her own mind, dancing, but there's no music anymore. Um, and, you know, the music kind of fades away as she fades away. So it's, you know, in my mind, she, she kind of, it's like this, you know, Pied Piper without anyone to lead. She just, she's gonna, you know, carry that music off with her into oblivion. But, um, but it's also one of those characters, I think, where when you're close to them, you, you can be intoxicated, you can be swept up in there. They're so charismatic and so that you do want to dance with them. They, they'll convince you actually that, that it is a party, even when rationally you know that <laughs> no good can come from this. Um, but you get some distance and yeah, it can be as simple as just, you know, someone clearly out of their mind, just, you know, in, in a derelict uh, alley, uh, fading off into blackness and soon all you can hear is the hum of the lights. So, I think trying to, you know, give her some poetry at the end, but also trying to be honest about the kind of the uglier reality of, you know, this is someone who ultimately is uh, lost in every sense of the word. Last question is uh, literally at the last moment of the film, as Manny is watching, uh, singing in the rain, he's also having this, uh, uh, like a clairvoyant vision into the future of what Hollywood will turn into the way it started with, with the sound. Uh, going into Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Tron and Avatar and all this other stuff. Um, what was behind like the movies that you chose for that last moment with Manny, like he's like he's having this like vision? Uh, it was it was a lot of it was kind of instinctive. That, you know, that there was there was just a, a basic kind of um, basic logic to it that I tried not to overthink because it, it did feel like something where logic could kind of kill it. Um, or at least what I wanted it to be. I wanted it to ultimately just be something guttural and something that you couldn't really maybe um, reduce into words too much. But, but the, the logic of it was, um, you know, uh, just sort of this idea of Hollywood movies in general, let's say, being, um, you know, dying and being reborn over and over and over again. That, you know, that, that, that's in some ways sort of my theory of cinema that is, you know, uh, 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 every decade we're told cinema is at its last gasp, cinema is dying, or it's already dead or something, you know. Um, we always think it's the first time that cinema's dying, but it, it's, it, th those headlines have been written since the silent era. Um, and so I think that, uh, and the thing is, it's not that they're completely wrong, because you can argue that every time someone is saying cinema's dying, maybe a certain kind of cinema is dying. Silent cinema did die. Yeah. You know, certain kinds of cinema, you can argue, do die but something else gets reborn in the ashes. And so that idea of just, you know, that, that it's, you know, it's uh, uh, death and rebirth, death and rebirth, it, whatever that might mean to, you know, we all have different interpretations of that, but that was kind of, for me, the guiding sort of guideline of what kinds of movies to choose, what kinds of movies not to. Beyond that, again, I would say it was instinctive. It was sort of, I had the track of music to play with and, and um, you know, you just kind of get a sense in the edit of just, what images are going to respond to each other, what aren't, you know. Uh, it becomes as simple sometimes as just, you know, uh, juxtaposing color in black and white or, or, you know, a diagonal with, a, with, a, uh, with uh, you know, with, with bright angles or, or, you know, circles with squares. I mean, it, it can become very sort of graphic like that. So I sort of had the parameters that I knew I wanted to kind of operate within. But ultimately, when you're actually kind of getting into throwing the images on, sometimes it does feel like that. It feels very spontaneous and instinctive because you kind of, I feel with this kind of, uh, that kind of sequence where you don't have dialogue, you don't have sort of character even really at that moment, it becomes much more abstract and formal. It'll tell you right away if, if something is not, not working. You know, it's sort of like the body rejecting, a, a, you know, a, an organ or something, you know, it, it'll kind of speak to you right away and tell you, oh, that's working, that's not working, it'll accept, accept certain things, not others. Well, no matter what happens, what's in the way it is, it died and reborn, the way it is evolved and transformed, what matters on that screen, people care, Pe you know, people care about what happens up on that screen. I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase what Brad Pitt said at one point in the movie. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, please, keep cinema, cinema alive and make sure you spread the word about Babylon. So, and how do you do that? I mean, you go on social media, so go on Twitter, well, maybe not Twitter. <laughs> 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 good one, good one. Facebook, you know, TikTok, 
in the back, if you're still using MySpace, that's totally fine. <laughs> but please spread the word about Babylon and trust. Yep, it just happened. I just briefly met Jimmy and Chazelle over there. I gotta say, Babylon, I'll give them my quick opinion, spoiler free and everything. I liked it. I know it's been polarized by critics and everything, but you know what? Screw it. This is my type of movie, you know? Movies about making movies. It's about cinema, man. It's cinema. This is what I want to do in my life. Hey, at least I met Damien Chazelle over here. Look. Better take a screenshot. And it's freaking awesome. I mean, yeah, I do recommend Babylon. I don't know, maybe once or twice. I don't recommend to watch it every day because also it's R-rated, so I cannot let any kids see this because there's a lot of sex and a lot of violence. But I do recommend it if you're 18 and over. So please do watch it if you're 18 and over. Don't watch it when you're a kid, okay? Because it's going to traumatize you. All right, that'll be it for now. And I hope you guys have a great new year. I mean, this is something I been wanted to do for a while to bump into this guy. But you know what? Hope we all have a good year. Hope 2023 will be something better. You guys take care and I'll see you guys later because I'm going to be busy with the family for, for the holidays. So yeah, take care guys.